Welcome back to the Educk Podcast. This is episode number 18. I'm your host, Robbie Boydston, here without my co-host, Eric Scopel, this week for the second week in a row. Uh, that with uh, good reason, though. Eric is back east covering the Oregon versus Virginia game along with Educk publisher Steve Summers. And we have plenty of post-game audio that we will let you listen to here. So you're not going to hear a bunch of me on the podcast this week. We're going to leave it up to the players and coaches here. But uh, you will hear from head coach Mark Helfrich. You will hear from freshman running back Thomas Tyner, who racked up a couple of touchdowns today in Oregon's victory. And you will also hear from redshirt sophomore quarterback Marcus Mariota. That being said, let's get into Oregon's Week 2 victory against Virginia. 59-10 59-10 to 10 is the final score, Oregon running in there, and pretty much from the get-go, establishing the tempo, establishing the pace, Marcus Mariota with a 71-yard run right off the bat, less than two minutes into the game, leads to a two-point conversion to lead Oregon to a 8 nothing lead. Uh, that is followed up by a DeAnthony Thomas one-yard run, PAT blocked from Matt Wogan, but Oregon holds a 14 nothing lead, less or a little over halfway into the first quarter. Uh, D'Anthony Thomas then adds another run, a 40-yard run, to the outside. Scampers uses his footwork and athleticism to stay in bounds as he's hit uh, into the end zone to make it 21 to nothing. Before Virginia tries to build a little bit of momentum, and really we're going to stop right there just to analyze Oregon really going back east. A lot of the the talk going into this game was was Oregon going to get out to a fast start? Really, they did, and Marcus Mariota made sure of that. Again, the redshirt sophomore showing a lot of poise behind center Mariota's 71 yard scamper kind of coming on a little bit of a surprise here uh to be honest from the standpoint that Virginia really did work early to try and keep the Ducks honest running up the middle they realized how strong the Ducks running game was but again they left a hole open for Mariota to burst through uh no middle linebacker there to pick up the quarterback as he scampered 71 yards for a touchdown there early on to put the Ducks ahead 8 nothing early after the two-point conversion attempt. Uh, D'Anthony Thomas adding on to it with a couple scores there in the first quarter. Giving Virginia credit, did not give up there. Uh, they had a, a couple of mishaps happen, including an early interception that uh, really could have put lesser teams down. But Virginia did respond with a 45-yard touchdown run towards the end of the first quarter by Kalik Shepard. Shepard kind of dissecting the Oregon defense running across field there with a uh, nice little scamper, giving him credit. Uh, Virginia was trying to keep the Ducks honest up the middle, trying to you know keep that box tight and keep the Ducks from running up the middle, gashing their uh, defensive linemen, their tackles there, and did a really good job early on. But again, they just wore down as the game went on. Uh, Braylon Addison adding a touchdown there in the second quarter, a 30-yard pass from Mariota. To make it 28-7, to Virginia adds on a field goal before halftime, but after that, it was all Ducks. Mario, or excuse me, uh, Alejandro Maldonado adds a field goal there early in the third quarter. Wasn't exactly a pretty kick, but it went through the uprights nonetheless, which I think for most Oregon fans is enough. So uh, that made that 31-10. to DeAnthony adds another touchdown on an 8-yard run to make it 38-10 to towards the end of the third quarter. Less than two minutes later, Keenan Lowe with another touch, or excuse me, with his first touchdown catch, 45 to 10, Oregon after that. And then the fourth quarter was the Thomas Tyner show. And again, we will hear from Tyner later on here in the podcast, uh, actually very shortly. And he had a three yard run there early on in the fourth. Less than two minutes later, follows that up with a 30 yard or 31 yard run for a touchdown. A very impressive day for a kid that a lot of people are expecting a lot out of this freshman season. Of course, Tyner being the five-star blue-chip prospect that Oregon brought in with the 2013 class. He was the jewel of the class. Didn't play at all last week against Nickel State due to a foot injury. Finally gets some playing time this week and really shines in his first couple of carries. Uh, Depending on who you're talking to, Tyner's either going to be injury-prone or he's going to be a stud running back. Today, he showed more of that stud running back mentality and adds his first two collegiate scores today, which is also a little bit funny considering that the man who was supposedly coming in with Tyner last recruiting class, Dontre Wilson, whom a lot of Duck fans know, flipped from Oregon after verbally committing there for many months to Ohio State after Chip Kelly left. He scored his first touchdown today for Ohio State, uh, where he did end up committing. 
So you're seeing a little bit of the, the that 2013 running back class shine early on here in the college football season, which is an encouraging sign, especially for Oregon fans who were very high on Tyner. Obviously, the low, the Aloha High School prospect garnered a lot of attention last season and even more this season now that he's on the big stage. So monitoring him going forward is going to be interesting. Obviously, D'Anthony has proven that he, at this point through two weeks, can be a featured back can be a guy who can take on a majority of the carries. He's added a lot of strength in terms of dragging tacklers along to get those extra yards. Not only that, Byron Marshall struggled a little bit today. He, he didn't see his best day running uh, 15 carries, 31 yards, only averaging two yards a carry. Uh, you take a look at DeAnthony Thomas, for example, who had 11 carries for 124 yards and three touchdowns. Tyner had two touchdowns off of four carries for 51 yards and you've got Mariota who rushed for 122 yards his second straight game with over 100 yards rushing uh, and also adds on that 71 yard TD you're seeing that Marshall might be finding himself a little bit farther on the down on the depth chart to Tyner if Tyner can keep this up Uh, no knock on Marshall obviously the Ducks have a very talented core uh, in terms of running backs but it just seemed today that Marshall wasn't able to get anything going. Tyner, with his limited carries, was able to get something going, averaging 12.8 yards a carry, according to ESPN here on the box score, which was pretty impressive. Uh, getting back to Mariota real quick, again, not his sharpest day passing. Last week he went 12 of 21. This week, 14 of 28. Not exactly what you expect from one of the nation's most accurate quarterbacks last season. Again, it, it seems like he needs a little bit more time to kind of get loose and and get his rhythm back. But that being said, 14 of 28 for 199 yards, throws for a couple of touchdowns, not a bad day. Uh, Jeff Lockie, the only person other than Mario to throw a pass today, uh, goes one of one for eight yards. Uh, not much of a statistic, but still something worth noting with Lockie being there. Um, obviously, we know that tendency that Oregon quarterbacks have of being injured uh, as the season goes on, so it'll be interesting to keep track of what Lockie's able to do. Uh, Eight different receivers from Oregon catching balls today. Josh Huff, uh, again, leading the pack, 55 yards receiving. No touchdowns, but had an impressive little grab there to set up uh, a red zone drive for Oregon later uh, in the game there. Uh, Braylon Addison also with three catches today for 54 yards and a touchdown, that 30-yarder. DeAnthony Thomas had a catch. Keenan Lowe with three catches and a touchdown as well. The, those are uh, Lowe and Addison, the only two to catch touchdown passes today. But at the same time, Oregon was able to get a little bit of damage done on the offensive end in terms of receiving, something that I'm sure a lot of fans want to see a little bit more of under the Mark Helfrich era. And we're going to go into the defensive side of the ball. Ducks with three picks today. Dior Mathis running back a ball 97 yards without getting a touchdown, which is very rare, but uh, brings it back all the way to the Virginia three on his pick. Picked it off in the end zone. Uh, quite a quite an interception return if you saw it. Uh, was about one block away from actually taking it all the way to the house. Terrence Mitchell returns to the lineup this week with a pick returned for 16 yards one week after he was ejected for a targeting penalty against Nichols State. Also, linebacker Rodney Hardrick coming up with a big pick there early in the third quarter to stop any momentum that Virginia was trying to build there in the second half. Uh, A little diving grab there to put Oregon back in possession and build upon their lead, which Oregon never turned back from. This was a huge win for Oregon. Again, not many people saw this as a true test whatsoever, but at the same time, Oregon was able to pick up a big win after traveling 3,000 miles east. We'll come home next week to play Tennessee, who forced five turnovers in six plays against Western Kentucky today, posting over 50 points en route to a big win. So Oregon might get a little bit more of a challenge than they were bargaining for against Tennessee next week in Autzen, but again, Oregon should be expected to win that game. Let's get into the postgame coverage here. Enough of me talking. Here is head coach Mark Helfrich with his thoughts on the game. First two questions are good ones. Penalties and what, what's wrong with Byron Marshall? Byron Marshall is a, is a great tailback. And, you know, uh, it's an 11-man job of running the football. There's absolutely nothing wrong with Byron Marshall. Uh, we could have put him 
in there at the end to you know pad those stats, but he knows that his football team won today. He didn't have bad stats today. His football team won today. So how big is it for you guys in a game like this where teams are kind of feeling each other out to get that 71 yard touchdown run? Let's see how we can do it against them. Um, you know, so much at the beginning, we knew that they weren't going to play us how they played BYU, and they didn't. They played us kind of completely differently, and we sort of anticipated some of that, uh, some of that stuff. We made some changes on the fly. Uh, our guys did a great job of, of, to use your phrase, feel feel them out. Um, but that's that's a good football team. It's the tallest, I think that's the tallest football team I've ever seen in my life. They're huge. Uh, but. Uh, you know, we had to, to just be on point in terms of communication, identifying what they, they were doing to, 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 you know, try to stop us. And our guys, for the most part, did a good job of that. What does, say, what does it say about them if they were a good football team that you just beat them 59 to 10? What does it say about you guys? Well, it's it's number two. That's what it says. You know, it's, and nothing more, nothing less. You know, we play another great program next week. Uh, our, our flight will be short going back. It will feel short. Um, and, and start preparing for Tennessee tomorrow. Uh, but the only thing it you know it does when you win is it gives you a chance to have one more you know and, and, and one one and is good two and is a little bit better and, and now we need to have a great Sunday in recovery and get home. You talked about those D tackles and you went right at them with that play with Marcus and suddenly in that situation you thought maybe there'd be a hole there. Well, those guys, man, as advertised up front, I thought they were outstanding. I think that defense is is, is really good. Um, you know, we had some guys that that play in particular, one of them where we kind of got a step and got the rest of the guys leaning, um, just something that we thought we had a shot to, to kind of spread the field and let, let Marcus let Marcus go and try to use their you know, kind of their aggression against them. And, and they, uh, they're very, again, I think that's a very talented team. Coach, were they over? do. And if we told you, we'd have to kill you. So again, again. But um, we want the ball in his hands. And uh, we, we're trying to make a concerted effort from, from the you know, first play to try to create some, again, some space, uh, whether it's the screen game or as a receiver, as a movement guy. But he likes to be that that guy, you know, kind of a moving target. Um, but we, we need the ball in his hands. And yeah, we, we talk about it all the time of ways and, and you know, ways to move him, ways to line him up, to, to get him the ball. I know that yeah, Anthony Thomas is back in the hallway. Perfect. You said you don't kind of 20 carries is about his limit as far as the running back goes. Just overall, as far as responsibility, how much do you think he can handle? I don't know. I've said before, you know, when I asked that, you never want to be able to answer that question because he's hurt, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, it's kind of like how many, how many pitches can the right-hander throw? I don't, you know, you don't want to get to that magic number when he's the Tommy John surgery. But, uh, uh, we need to get him the ball. He's a great player, and, and you know, going back, and I'm not trying to be smart about Byron Marshall, but at some point, someone's not going to have the ball in our offense, and sometimes we'll throw it, sometimes we'll run it, and that's where somebody else needs to, to pick up the slack. Were they over pursuing a little bit on the running back on those inside runs because they were stuffing pretty good early with the defensive tackles, which is why I think they took advantage of Marcus making that run. Did, were they over pursuing, or were the guards missing some assignments? What was going on with those early run stuffs that was happening inside? Are you saying from, from our standpoint? From, well, from their standpoint, were they overplaying the running backs on that on those reads, or why were they like successful somebody, against your inside zone? The inside zone was stuffed they early. Like great defensive line, uh, very stout front guys. They they moved a lot, and we were trying to give them some some different looks. Uh, uh, but you know, we thought if if, if we stayed with our, our plan, we'd, we'd be okay in the end. What did Thomas Tyner show you? Just a few touches today. Natural runner, man. He that, that zone cut on the, uh, his longer touchdown. I thought that was a really, it was a natural cut. Guys kind of have that, and they don't. That's not something. Gary Campbell's an unbelievable running back coach, but you can't, you can't teach that feel uh, and that kind of angle uh, that he took. And so that that's encouraging. Our coach Cruz, what do you by the way your team handled the travel? That's a long trip. Great. Great. Yeah, very. They were very good with that. Again, that's that's why it was just frustrating with the, the penalties. I thought we were. I thought we handled everything great except some silly penalties, and that's gonna that's gonna haunt us against different people, um, and could have haunted us today. But all in all, uh, we need to finish it up the right way on our way home. And, and, and a lot of penalties is one. A lot of penalties is one thing. Get five 15-yard penalties in the first half. How much more of a concern is that than just having a bunch of silly little penalties? Well, that's that's what I'm saying. I mean, a couple of those I think were interesting. You know, <laughs> and, and I don't mean that. I'm not. Arguing them, yeah. I mean, it, it's the you know 
they were called. And then, so we're going to certainly address them. And I, and I did address them. And, and you know, we talked about a halftime. We played with, play with incredible desire. We played with incredible desire and discipline. And that's that's not something that we're ever going to stand for or be about is, is those kind of penalties. Uh, you know, all those guys are coming over and apologizing to me. And, you know, it doesn't help us now. <laughs> right after it happens and, and so that that'll be fixed. On pass plays? Yeah, that would have been another penalty. Braylon had yeah. a touchdown where Hamani was like Yeah Braylon had a screen that was yeah, a screen right. uh, and, and Hamani did a great job getting out and, and leading the way. Uh, but that's what we need those guys to do. They need to run and just just be big, run through guys, make them make them Change, make the defender change the direction and get our guy in space. Uh, and, and he had a great uh, job on that screen. Harunas Gross, who had an incredible cut on uh, DeAnthony's touchdown, kind of towards the, the grass hill end. Uh, so those guys, you know, need to keep doing what they're doing and away a couple times. Second straight game, Marcus had over 100 yards on the ground. You talked about the preseason about wanting to have to make more big plays this year and be a playmaker. How much more of an emphasis have you wanted to have to make plays with this week? Um, it's not really been, I guess, any emphasis more, but but just uh, done a couple of different things um, that, that turned out that way. Like the, the quarterback draw uh, was something that kind of came up because of, of how Virginia aligned to that particular formation. And so that's something where we're going to pick our spots and, and try to have him. So there's Mark Helfrich's thoughts on the game. One of the early things he discussed there was Byron Marshall. Uh, a few reporters wondering, what's wrong with Byron Marshall? Really... One of the things that I thought was important coming out of this game was the development of Byron Marshall. Marshall showed at the end of last season that he was developing more as a running back, a guy who could or who had earned a few more carries, and during the spring game had shown that he was a guy that was looking to try and become a featured back, uh, obviously knowing that Thomas Tyner was going to come in and uh, try and usurp some carries as well as DeAnthony Thomas slated for the feature back spot. Marshall was a guy who was going to be left there trying to fight for some carries and ended up looking like he was going to earn some of them heading in or heading out of the spring game. But again, struggled today trying to run up the middle. Again, give credit to the Virginia defense from the standpoint of they really locked up the box, made sure that the Ducks weren't going to run too far up the middle for most of the game and ended up giving up most of their yards to the outside. That being said, Tyner was able to kind of dissect the Virginia defense in a way that Marshall was not. So it'll be interesting going forward to see what is going to happen towards uh, the positioning with the running back game. Will it be Tyner as the second string? Will Marshall be the second string? Uh, We'll have to keep an eye on that going forward. Now let's get into the postgame thoughts of Thomas Tyner, a little bit of a segue there. Uh, and see what he thought about scoring his first two collegiate touchdowns as an Oregon Duck. Feelings on getting first action and getting two touchdowns? Pretty exciting. Yeah, very exciting. Uh, the feeling I got after that, uh, the lineman and the ball offense came up to me afterwards and gave me hugs. And it was overall exciting. You, you probably knew you were going in when they got the ball. The defense got the turnover on the four or five yard line. I think that was a return. Um, when Mathis returned, did you know you were going in the next series? Yeah, Coach Cam told me that. When he was running, when he went out of bounds at the three, did you think, oh my God, I'm going to score? Yeah. Definitely, <laughs> yeah. How excited were you when you got in there? And was your heart rate up there? Uh, yeah, I was watching going the whole game. And, uh, I mean, for me to be in the end zone when I first carried ever as a duck was uh, just exciting. And I couldn't even explain it. What was it like to do that with, because you were happy to be going into the end zone that most of the Duck fans were out? What was it like to be able to do that on the road with those that many Duck fans there in the corner for you? It was great. It just shows how well of the team we are, like we're a national brand, and how well our fans are, and just the family and atmosphere that Oregon has is just amazing. Your, your first experience out there, is that what you expected? Um, yeah. I mean, just, just the joy of everything. Um, seeing after other people score their touchdowns is everyone's all excited for I mean, for me to live that for us. Do you imagine a better first carry for your career? I mean, it was short, but <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was fun. Uh, I think getting the carry is just an opportunity, and it was awesome. How did you feel? So, I mean, obviously a few touches, but it seemed like you were doing some really good runs there. How did you feel out there? Uh, I felt good. Um, I felt filled up. I was 100%. Um, and everything felt fine. So 
that's fine. Humphrey said the cut you made on your long touchdown the way you took that attack was gone, and that's something that even Coach Campbell can't coach. Even though he's a great coach. Uh, given your natural ability to do things like that, do you feel like, even though you're a freshman, that you are already on this level and that you could be with any type of team in the nation? Um, yeah, when I first came in, I felt like I had to adjust a lot. Um, practicing against our defense, which is one of the best around our uh, A game, and they prepared me well for the games. And uh, yeah, just practice prepared me. Looking back at yourself from day one at camp to now, how much better are you as a football player? I think I'm a lot better. Um, I think uh, I had a setback earlier this year, uh, last week, and uh, a couple practices, uh, and it helped me a lot with mental reps. I got a bunch of mental reps, and um, I didn't ever limit myself, but I still studied and everything, and so I showed today too. Thomas, is a bit of the pressure off now since you've got some snaps in a game, and obviously you got the first touchdown out of the way. Is, is the pressure off a little bit? Um, I never really like to put pressure on myself. You know, as long as I know what I'm doing, there's no, 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 no pressure on myself. Did you always know you were going to get in today, or were you starting to wonder there in the fourth quarter? I was starting to wonder. Um, and then Coach Campbell and decided to tell me to get ready, so I started to wonder. You carried the ball four times, two of them were touchdowns. What happened on those other two? Um, <laughs> 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 How tough is that waiting game? I mean, the wait three quarters before you can get in the game. You mentioned doubting a little bit towards the end there. How tough is that waiting game on the sideline? Um, I just enjoy watching the game. I mean, I don't really like standing on the sideline, but just uh, being there with the team and monitoring, watching them play, it's, it's great. Um, how close do you feel like you're ready to be a weapon for this team from snap one all the way through the end? I feel like I'm ready. I feel like whatever they throw at me, um, I think they prepared me well, and I see how we handled it. Was the adjustment more just from high school to college? You know, everybody talks about the difference in speed. Was it more that, or was it just the mental aspect of the, of the game, and, and how did you kind of learn from that? Uh, well, size and speed is a definite change from high school to college. Um, I mean, I did get a little bit of experience with that in the Army game, but it's just a whole different level, and uh, I can really tell. My first carriers, how big they were. Uh, line up in the backfield and see the linebackers, how big they were. And, uh, but as again, before I said, uh, I adjusted well. They helped me adjust well in practice. And, but they prepared for me. You might answer this in a game like that, Paul. When you mentioned Coach Gann tells you to go warm up because you're going in, what sort of emotions, whatever, were you feeling at that point? Any uh, butterflies? Any yes, butterflies. A little bit of butterflies. Uh, nothing wrong with being a little nervous. Um, and, so that was Thomas Tyner, Oregon five-star prospect out of Aloha High School, discussing his first game as a Duck where he racked up two touchdowns. We're now going to segue into his quarterback, Marcus Mariota, discussing his big performance against Virginia in the 59-10 victory. And, um, you know, for our offense, especially our offensive line, to, to kind of have the game that we did, you know, that's a huge confidence boost to him. How much of you guys are in the back of the game? The teams are totally jacked up to try to slow you guys down. And, you know, five plays in, they're doing a good job. They think they're going to get off the field. How, how much of a backbreaker is even one touchdown down in the first series of the game? Um, you know, that it's definitely a huge momentum shift. Um, you know, I'm sure they're they're more juiced than just you know, not having one touchdown would be the, the deciding factor. But you know, those guys came on to play hard. You know, my hat was my hat's off to them because um, they really wanted to come out and stop us. And um, you know, they did a good job for a few drives, uh, especially after those first three touchdown drives. They came in and kind of slowed us down a little bit. But you know, the guys up front and you know my receiving core, I thought we just kind of battled back and we were able to finish with. It. The game wore on. It seemed like you guys really <clears throat> blew this thing up. And it, it, what point do you do, do you see this a lot of teams where you start to get inside their heads just with the way you play? I wouldn't say that. I think we 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 are more focused on ourselves. Um, you know, we wanted to finish drives. Um, like, you know, like I said earlier, we, we started off the, the game with three touchdown drives and we kind of slowed down a little bit. And you know, we were kind of harping on ourselves to just finish it. I mean, we had a couple times where we were in the red zone and we got stopped in fourth time. Um, you know, if we were able just to finish those drives, you know, the game could have been blown open even earlier. But, you know, it's it's the way that we wanna we wanna focus on ourselves and not really those other the other team and just make sure we are balanced. Josh Hop is back here. <clears throat> I think just the 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 
amount of, uh, I guess, the, the, the culture that we built here, um, it hasn't changed at all, especially with the fact that Chris Helbridge was, was a, you know, within the program and he understands the, the way that we kind of run things around here. And, um, you know, as as, uh, as it continues to go on, I think guys understand that, you know, this culture is successful and, and watching. Is Chip Timbrick still on? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. You know, he, he was uh, the guy that kind of really just changed, changed the perspective a little bit for his team, um, even before I got here. And, uh, you know, I'm sure his imprint will be for here for a long time. And, um, you know, like I said, it's been successful. And, you know, we're not going to try to fix that. Marcus, Raylan was good last year, but he looks a lot better this year. Can you talk a little bit about his development this year? Because he's, he's done a lot better in the first Oh, years. sure. He's, the way, his, his knack for, for uh, the yards after catch and stuff like that, it's, I mean, it's, <laughs> so I know you're fine. Um, you know, he, he does an awesome job. He's been, he's been doing that since fall camp. I mean, he's been doing it all summer long. And, um, you know, it's kind of something that we expected. How hard has he worked on the blocking? Because it looks he's been blocking a lot better this year, too. Oh, yeah, I think all those guys outside have, have done an awesome job blocking. Um, you know, like, there's a saying around here that says if, you know, if you don't block, you don't get the rock. And, um, you know, these guys, these guys really live, live to that because, you know, they, I mean, obviously they want to get the ball. They're playmakers. So they're going to they're gonna block your tails off for the guy that's running the ball. Marcus, what's, if you had to explain how much more you're doing this year than last, how would you describe it? Um... I don't know. I'm I'm doing my best to just um, put our offense in good good situations. Um, you know, Coach Albert and Coach Ross developed awesome game plans for us. But you have more options than you had last year, right? I mean, more plays, more you understand more. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, like I was saying earlier, if I if I see somewhere, it'll put us in the better spot I can, and um, I'm. I'm happy to do that. You know, Coach Alfred and Coach Ross have you know, given me the ability to just make sure I see some you know, I can whether it's changing the protection or maybe checking into the play. Um, you know, they're giving me that kind of rain. Did um, you do that today? Did you make an example? Um, I think one play was, there was a, I think it was third and seven or something like that. We were headed in and uh, I just, I mean, change the protection and stuff. He's a main and we've been doing this for a couple of years now. Um, I just hit the protection one way and uh, really ended up having a nice little hole underneath the coverage and just hit him for a first down. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different examples like that, but um, like I said, really, it's just the coaches develop the game plan. They tell me what kind of checks they think might work, and um, I'm just happy to really How much more fun is that for you? It's a lot, it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, because for me, my, my thing is I just want to get the ball out to these guys and, and watch them do the thing. I mean, great great example is Braylon takes a, a ton of screen for six. And it's, I mean, it's fun to watch because um, as, as, a play, as a quarterback in this offense, I think he's more as a point guard. Get it out to other guys. It's just something for me to see that you know, it'll open our confidence in good situations. Is there anything else long, for Marcus if I can bring him out in the hall? Jason, question. Uh, that long, you're a point guard, you had that long drive for the basket there early in the game. You kept the ball yourself. Yeah, it was, it was like I said, it was, um, it was my hats off to the guys up front and the guys outside. I mean, they really did a good job blocking. Uh, they kind of came on the look that we practiced all week. Um, it just happened that it opened up and I was able to kind of crease it. So that was Marcus Mariota. That is your wrap-up for the interview process of today's 59-10 victory over Virginia for Oregon. And coming out of that, it seems like Oregon still has some things to work on. Obviously, the defensive line looked a little shaky at times during certain points of the game. The offensive line as well, not being able to pick up what looked like a few blocks to open up some holes up the middle for the Oregon running backs. But at the same time, Oregon walks away with a 49-point victory, a seven-touchdown win on the road on the East Coast, coming back home to play a Tennessee team that once again had five turnovers today in six plays against Western Kentucky. That is Bobby Petrino's Western Kentucky team. Of course, Bobby Petrino taking Arkansas to a Sugar Bowl here not too long ago before being let go. So let's do a little bit of recruiting news really quick uh, to send you on your way. Uh, a few 2015 prospects got a chance to check out Oregon today. Again, if you saw this on educk.com in the tail feathers section, uh, great. If not, here's your update. Credit to Brandon Huffman of scout.com for this. Ricky DeBerry, Austin Clark, Derek Nadi, Jason Lewis, and Giovanni Simmons. A few 
solid 2015 talents, and by solid, a few of these guys are elite. Um, got to check out Oregon today. DeBerry has over 40 offers claimed. Five-star prospect, the number two DE in the 2015 class, according to Scout.com. Nadia, four-star prospect, listed as Scout.com's number seven defensive tackle. Over 15 offers claimed. Austin Clark, a six foot six, 280-pound offensive tackle, not ranked currently by Scout, but has seven offers. Jason Lewis, six foot three, 234-pound wide receiver, has over a dozen offers. Four-star prospect, the number 13 wide receiver out of the 2015 class, according to Scout.com. Giovanni Simmons, a six foot one, 230-pound middle linebacker, has only a few offers, but is a four-star prospect. And the number seven middle linebacker listed by Scout.com. Also, 2014 prospect Jamil Kamara, six foot two, 205 pound prospect, uh, wide receiver, the 20th ranked wide receiver on Scout.com's list, was also reportedly in attendance. So, a look at some of these guys that, uh, looking towards the future, could be targets for Oregon now that they've seen them. Obviously, of course, Matt Lubick has a big connection to wide receivers back east with his time at Duke. And the Oregon coaching staff has never been really afraid of targeting athletes in SEC country. So something to look forward to. Uh, also, at ACC country, I guess we should be saying. Uh, they're, they're not too afraid of going back east 3,000 miles away to try and get an athlete to come to Oregon. So some names to look forward to going forward. Uh, got a couple of visit reports as well from Tui Talia, obviously in Oregon, verbal commit right now at the defensive tackle position. He really enjoyed his visit, got to hang out a little bit with Sam Jones. Sam Jones, uh, of course, giving a visit as well. If you haven't seen these, go to educk.com and read the reports of how they viewed their uh, Oregon visits last weekend when they got to see Oregon take on Nickel State. Arian Springs and Braxton Berrios, a wide receiver out of North Carolina, was also in attendance. Uh, Springs also a verbal commit to Oregon, so really just kind of checking out things and uh, kind of getting that in-game experience that Springs will likely experience next year, uh, being the type of talent that he is. Talia really was wowed by his visit, as well was Jones. Jones obviously hasn't picked a school yet, but said that Oregon is his front runner at the moment. He said he didn't know if it was so much about the whole fact that it was his official visit and he was just kind of wowed initially, but he did really take a shine to Oregon, what they were able to do, enjoyed his time with the offensive linemen, really getting to know them, getting to know the coaches. And so it'll be interesting going forward to see if Oregon can lock up a big offensive tackle prospect in Jones out of uh, Thunder Ridge High School in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, going forward. Barrios not commenting too much after the trip, but it does sound like he had a good trip, and it'll be interesting going forward to see whether or not Oregon is a major player for him in his recruitment. That being said, Oregon did get some news, uh, a little bit of the bad sort from offensive tackle Lath Freck this week out of Centennial High School in Peoria, Arizona, which is near the Phoenix area. Uh, indicated that he was going to come out to Oregon for the Tennessee game a couple of months ago. Now that has fallen by the wayside, he will not be taking a visit and also said that Oregon is out of the picture for him. He had a talk with the coaches, and they mutually parted ways. So Leith Freck not on the Oregon radar any longer. This could be attributed to Sam Jones's visit. Maybe Oregon thought that they're going to have a better shot at Jones or whether or not that is the case. Freck is no longer in the picture for Oregon. So looking forward, it'll be interesting heading into next week when they have a number of talents coming in for the Tennessee game. Obviously, Buda Baker out of Bellevue, Washington, will be one of them. Micaiah Quick, a top receiving prospect out of California, will be in attendance reportedly, as well as possibly Adoree Jackson, a top defensive back prospect out of California, he will possibly be in attendance next week. If not, John Plattenberg is reportedly going to be there, a top Texas cornerback that is looking at Oregon and has been worked pretty hard by Arian Springs thus far in terms of coming to Oregon. So he's a guy to keep your eye on going forward. So even though Freck will not be making it, no shortage of talent coming through next week for Oregon as they take on Tennessee, who again put up a big victory today against Western Kentucky. So with that being said, we are going to wrap up the EDUC podcast this week right here. 
a nice short one again, as you will expect through most of the season. So uh, just to let you know going forward, these podcasts less on the hour to hour 15 side as they were in the beginning, more on the probably 25 to 35 minute side going forward, at least through the season next week, hopefully with everyone in attendance um, and schedules permitting, we will have the normal podcast up with Eric and I here. Until then, keep checking eDuck for all your recruiting news, all of your football news heading into week three against Tennessee. We will have all the coverage. Uh, keep checking Eric's reports. He is available at at Eric underscore Scopel, S-K-O-P-I-L is his last name. He also spells Eric with a K, so remember that. I am available at at Arboydston underscore eDuck. If you need any help spelling that, it is B-O-Y-D-S-T-U-N or just click on our profiles on educk.com. We both have links to our Twitter there. Uh, Please participate in the forums. We love the discussion that's going on there. Uh, Obviously a lot to talk about heading into week three against Tennessee and SEC foe finally coming to Autzen. This is going to be a little bit of buzz, a little bit of excitement heading into next week before conference play starts on the 28th when Oregon takes on Cal. So enjoy it this next week before the week off. I am your host, Robbie Boydston. This has been the 18th episode of the EDUC podcast, and I will talk to you all next week.